I'm a lifelong humanist. My home society is the New York Society for Ethical Culture. I'm also a member of the Humanist Society of Greater Phoenix um, and a friend of the uh, Humanist Society of Northern Westchester, so um, this feels like home. Um, for a year or so, I've been working with the Factory Farm Awareness Coalition. We're a nonprofit dedicated to educating people about where our food comes from. So, so here's a quick outline of uh, what we'll be talking about today. Um, quick disclaimer, there is some disturbing content because you can't really talk about factory farming without it being disturbing. But there are no bloody videos, no slaughterhouse footage, nothing like that. And the animals, I will introduce you to individual animals, but they are all rescued, safe, happy, and free. Okay? And we'll have cuteness interludes. Okay. So factory farming is technically known as concentrated animal feeding operations, or CAFOs. It's the practice of keeping thousands of animals confined indoors for their entire lives. This is done to produce the most product for the most profit. Family farmers have largely become a thing of the past. In each of the, the major industries, cow, pig, and chicken industries, there are just four corporations that control the majority of production. So it's just a handful of corporations controlling this entire part of our food system. Some of these names might be familiar, JBS, Cargill, Tyson, Smithfield. So why factory farming? These corporations contend that they're helping the world by producing cheap food. And it's true that Americans currently spend a smaller percentage of our income on food than we ever have before. But as we'll see, this supposedly cheap food actually comes at a very steep price. So does anyone want to guess how many animals are bred and killed every year for food in the United States? Two billion? Any more guesses? Nine billion. So every year in the US alone, nine billion animals are raised and killed for meat, eggs, and milk. That's nine billion land mammals, not, e not even counting fish. And that's in the US alone. Nine billion every single year. Worldwide, there are about 75 billion animals killed every year. So, of these 9 billion animals raised in the U.S., does anyone want to guess what percentage of them are raised on factory farms? Any more guesses? 95? 99%. Okay, so 99% of all animals in the U.S. are raised on factory farms. Pretty much any meat that you see in a restaurant or at the supermarket comes from a factory farm. So what is life like for these 9 billion land animals? Um, we're not going to meet a few of these animals. Let's start with chickens, specifically layer hens. This is Lucy. Lucy's a layer chicken, which means she was bred to raise as many eggs as possible. She spent the first year of her life on a factory farm. I'm going to tell you what her life was like before she was rescued. So shortly after she was born, Lucy had her beak cut off without any anesthetic. In normal conditions, chickens develop a hierarchy. That's where we get the term pecking order. But in confinement, chickens can't maintain their normal social order. 
many birds get so stressed that they peck at or even cannibalize other birds. So to prevent chickens from attacking one another, their beaks are cut off. This is extremely painful and debilitating for the chicks, and many of them die because they're not able to eat after being de-beaked. Here we'll see a video of the machine that de-beaks the chickens. Don't worry, it's not bloody. I just want to give you a glimpse into industrialized animal farming. Okay, this is standard practice on all egg farms. It's a far cry from what most of us imagine when we think of where our eggs come from. Battery cages. So as soon as Lucy got big enough, she was put into a battery cage, which is what you see here. The cage was so small that she literally couldn't move. The her body and her wings were pressed up against the other chickens and against the bars of the cage, and she was standing on top of wire mesh. And she had to live like this, never leaving the cage for an entire year. She was kept in a barn with 50,000 other chickens, all in cages stacked row upon row. After just a year or two, chickens' bodies give out from the stress of these unnatural conditions. At this point, they produce fewer eggs, so they're not as valuable. So they're sent to a slaughterhouse to become dog food or other low-grade chicken products. But Lucy was the exception. The man who owned the farm went bankrupt and abandoned all the chickens. 7,000 hens died before the, the uh, officials intervened. Animal Place, a sanctuary, rescued 4,500 of the hens. Lucy was one of the lucky ones. So Lucy will now get to live out the rest of her life in conditions that we imagine chickens should live in, pecking at dirt and grass and lying in the sunlight. But the reality is that 90% of all egg-laying chickens in the U.S. spend their entire lives in cages on factory farms until they're slaughtered at one year. So what happens to the male chicks? They obviously don't lay eggs, and they don't get big enough to be valuable for meat. So male layer chicks, more than 200 million a year, are dumped into grinders and ground up alive. Some good news. Last March, a German scientist revealed that she had discovered a method for detecting the gender of a chick inside the egg. Germany is promising to use that technology to eliminate the culling of male chicks by 2017. Cuteness interlude. Okay, broiler chickens. These are chickens raised for meat. This is Gryffindor, a factory farm broiler chicken. So, broiler chickens have been bred to grow bigger than ever before, more quickly than ever before. They now grow twice as big as they used to in just half the time. So here you see the size of a fully grown chicken in 68 days old at, in 1950 and one you see in 2008. So you can see the difference. So because chickens now grow so quickly, they're fully grown and ready to be slaughtered at only six weeks old. That's as though we raised human children to weigh 600 pounds by the time they're 12 years old. So, as you can imagine, this unnaturally fast growth places a lot of stress on the chickens. 90% of them can't walk normally because their legs simply can't support all that weight. So, if they hadn't been rescued, Gryffindor and Lucy would have been sent to slaughter. First, they'd be loaded 
into crates on trucks. According to expected industry rates, a worker should crate 30 birds every minute. So he grabs several birds at once by the legs and throws them into these crates that we see here. So as a result of this rough handling, about 30% of the birds will arrive with freshly broken bones. Okay. Humane methods of slaughter. Um, in the US, one of the few federal laws, one of the very few federal laws to protect farm animals is the Humane Methods of Slaughter Act. This states that animals must be unconscious prior to slaughter but the law doesn't apply to chickens or turkey, the two most commonly slaughtered animals in the US. So once the chickens arrive at the slaughterhouse, they're hung up by their legs and shackles on a moving conveyor belt system. Remember, their legs are often broken by this point. Then they'll have their throat slit, either by a person or by a machine, and then continue to move down the conveyor belt as they die of blood loss. But these are small animals, and they're terrified. So they're flapping around. People don't always cut the right artery. So according to government, government estimates, 4 million birds are alive and fully conscious when their bodies are submerged into scalding tank, where they're literally boiled alive. 4 million chickens every year. That's over 10,000 chickens every single day. So what about cage free and free range? What about all these products with special labels? Let's start with cage free. So, um, whoa, I'm unorganic and I want to be on cage free. Okay, so this is a cage-free farm, but it's a far cry from what most people imagine when they see cage-free. I see pictures of happy animals on the packaging. The hens are still kept in sheds by the tens of thousands for their entire lives and still have their beaks cut off without pain relief. What about free range? So to be considered free range, chickens raised for meat must have access to the outdoors, but there are no rules for exactly what that means. So a shed with 30,000 chickens and a small door at one end that opens up onto a tiny dirt patch can count as free range, even if not a single chicken ever steps foot outside. So on the left, you see the wording of a carton of Judy's eggs, free range organic eggs from Petaluma. It says hens are raised in wide open spaces in Sonoma Valley where they're free to roam, scratch, and play. On the right, you see the reality. Chickens spend their entire lives in industrial barns. Judy's recently settled the lawsuit for misleading consumers, but the company is still certified organic and cage-free, even though it's a factory farm. Judy's eggs are also rebranded as Uncle Eddie's, Rock Island, and Gold Circle, and they supply Whole Foods 365 brand and Organic Valley. So even some of the most respected organic free-range brands are sourcing from factory farms. So what about organic? Um, organic means very little about the animal treatment. It's mostly related to input and thereby consumer health. The animals aren't given hormones, antibiotics, or GMO or pesticide-laden feed. Organic chickens must also be given uh, access to the outdoors with the same meaningless language as free range requirement. Organic chickens can still be de-beaked. And so what about humane? The label humane is entirely meaningless. There's no definition or enforcement behind this label. Cuteness interlude. Okay, now I'm going to move on to dairy and tell you about Sadie. 
Just some basics. Like all mammals, cows only produce milk when they're pregnant or nursing. Humans are the only species that consume milk after we're no longer babies. Usually only babies drink milk. We're also the only species that regularly drinks a different species' milk. And actually 75% of adults in the world are lactose intolerant. So it's not inherently natural for humans to drink milk from cows. Slight trigger warning here. I'm going to talk a bit about sexual violence. So in order for humans to get large amounts of milk from Sadie, she had to be impregnated. This was done via forcible artificial insemination using a device that the industry itself calls the rape rack. So these female animals are routinely exploited for the reproductive systems. Next we'll see an undercover video of what happens to the calves after they're born. Any time we drink cow's milk, it means that a baby calf was deprived of his or her mother's milk. Both mother and calf often cry for days after they've been separated. So what about the calves? After the calves are taken from their mothers, they're put into tiny crates. They never see their mothers again. They never get to play with other calves or run on the grass. They barely have enough space to turn around. Once her calf was taken away from her, Sadie was hooked up to a machine three times a day that took the milk intended for her calf. After 10 or 12 months of being milked, she was again artificially impregnated. Her calf was again taken away from her, and she was again milked three times a day. This happened to her year after year until she could no longer produce a valuable amount of milk. Luckily, at that time, Sadie was rescued. But most dairy cows are sent to slaughter to become either hamburger meat or dog food. So what about local? We talked about the misleading labeling used, to, uh, used on chicken and, and egg packaging. What about dairy? One of the ways that many corporations mislead consumers is by rebranding products to sound like they're coming from small local farms. In the Bay Area, we have Berkeley Farms, which sounds like a nice local farm. But I live in Berkeley, and I've never come across any dairy farms. Berkeley Farms is owned by Dean Foods, which is the largest dairy manufacturer in the country. 
pretty much any brand name that you see in the supermarket, Horizon, Land of Lakes, Knudsen, is coming from a factory farm. Okay. What happened to our organic? Organic. What about organic? Just as with chickens and eggs, most of the requirement for uh, organic relate to consumer health rather than animal welfare. Cows producing organic milk aren't given bonine growth hormone, but even the most humane farms like Clover and Strauss separate newborn calves from their mothers and auction off the male calves to become veal. The good news, of course, is that there are so many plant-based milks on the market. Milk is one of the easiest products to replace. We can leave the milk for the baby cows and drink plant-based milk instead. Cuteness interlude. So now I'm going to talk about Ruby. She's a smart, spunky little pig. Pigs are actually smarter than dogs and very social. During the 16 weeks of Ruby's mom's pregnancy, she was confined to a gestation crate, so small she couldn't turn around, she couldn't move. She literally went insane from boredom. She would compulsively chew on the bars of the cage and bang her head against the side of the crate. Animal welfare activists have been pressuring companies to abolish gestation crates with some success. Hmm. What happened to my video? Oh, well. Okay. After giving birth, Ruby's mom was confined to a farrowing crate, which is just as restrictive as a gestation crate. She's forced to continually nurse Ruby and her siblings without having any other contact with them. Sometimes she was strapped to the floor while nursing. A mother pig in its natural surroundings creates a bed of straw and nuzzles and actually sings a song to her piglets. Within their first two days of life, Ruby and her siblings had their tails cut off without any anesthetic. Tail docking serves the same purpose as chicken debeaking. Pigs get stressed because of the cramped conditions, so they start attacking each other. Pigs show aggression by biting tails, so workers preemptively cut their tails off, and as well as the sharp parts of their teeth. Within 10 days, Ruby's brothers had their testicles torn out, again without pain relief. So a lot of people ask, why isn't this illegal? And the sad reality is that, that farmed animals have virtually no legal protections. Every state has laws against uh, animal cruelty, but all, almost every state also has what's called a common farming uh, practice exception. States stating that if a practice is commonly done on a factory farm, it's legal. Cutting off a puppy's tail without anesthetic or keeping a pregnant dog locked in a closet for 16 weeks, felony animal cruelty. Cutting off a piglet's tail without anesthetic, automatically legal because it's common practice on factory farms. I love pigs. So now I'm going to talk about fish. When we think of fishing, we tend to think of quaint little fishing boats. The boat you, you're going to see here is called a super trawler, and it uses nets over a mile long to sweep up everything in its path. They just catch everything they possibly can without regard for the ecosystem or maintaining stable fish populations. As a result, global fish populations are in a state of crisis. So 
see this this net is actually a mile long. net a mile long into the ocean, you're going to catch a lot more than tuna or halibut or whatever it is you're trying to sell. Every type of creature that lives in the sea is caught and killed in these nets. That includes sea turtles, sharks, whales, and dolphins. The problem is called bycatch. Shrimp, shrimp farming has particularly devastating levels of bycatch. For every pound of shrimp caught, there are 26 pounds of bycatch. As global fish populations dwindle, companies are increasingly turning to fish farming, which is known as aquaculture. Roughly half of all fish now comes from fish farms. Fish farming is just factory farming, but in the water. All the same principles and problems apply. Fish farms house millions of fish in giant netted pens in rivers or oceans in such confined conditions that the fish are often literally swimming on top of each other. Having so many animals in proximity results in tremendous concentrations of manure, which is washed directly into the local river or ocean ecosystem. This causes dead zones where there's not enough oxygen in the water to sustain life. Intensive confinement also leads to disease, so fish are fed antibiotics in their feed which again washes out into surrounding aquatic ecosystems. You might think, well, at least this means we're not depriving wild, we're not depleting wild fish populations anymore. But in fact, farm fish are fed wild caught fish. It takes up to five pounds of wild caught feeder fish to raise a single pound of farm salmon. So it's really the worst of both worlds. Okay, now I'll switch gears and talk about workers' rights. So, slaughterhouse workers do some of the most dangerous jobs in the country, but most have no health insurance. They're doing the same one motion thousands of times every day. Slaughterhouse workers have cumulative trauma injury rates at 33 times higher than other types of factory workers. Often companies recruit undocumented workers because they know they won't be able to speak out against these horrific conditions. So these jobs are of course deeply psychologically disturbing. Many work workers develop PTSD from seeing so much suffering and death day after day. They don't have access to basic health care, let alone mental health care, so often they self-medicate with alcohol or drugs. The cleaning crew usually arrives around midnight, and by sunrise they have to clean the remains of three or 4,000 cattle that have been sla slaughtered at the plant that day. So, and they do this while all the conveyor belts are running and slaughtering machines are on. So you can imagine how dangerous the job is. At the National Beef Plant in Kansas, a man climbed into a blood collection tank, 30 feet high. He, was, he jumped in to clean it. He was overcome by the fumes and fell into the tank. Two workers climbed into the tank to rescue him. All three men drowned in blood. OSHA later found, uh, fined the National Beef uh, Company for its negligence. The fine, any guesses? $480 for each man's death.
So let's look at some of the environmental aspects of factory farming. Animal agriculture is arguably as devastating or more so to the planet as the oil and gas industries. Remember, nine billion animals are bred and killed every single year in the US. These are living, breathing, eating, pooping animals. All these nine billion animals require tremendous amounts of feed. And they're mostly eating genetically modified corn and soy. Farm animals are the largest consumers of corn and soy in the US and the largest consumers of GMOs. Animals are very inefficient sources of food. You have to give an animal anywhere from twice to 15 times more feed than the amount of food you get from actually eating, from eating that animal. So according to the latest studies, if we cut global meat consumption in half, we could free up enough land to feed not only the world's current population, but also an extra 3 billion people. So here you see the amount of land required uh, to feed people on different diets. You can grow enough food to feed a vegan for a year on just a sixth of an acre. Well, you need 18 times more land to support an omnivore for a year. Cattle ranching is the leading cause of rainforests being cut down, especially in Brazil. So you might be thinking, what about free range? In the US, over 260 million acres of forest have been cut down to clear land to graze cattle, so-called free range cattle. And the USDA's wildlife services um, actually kills all kinds of native predators with traps and snares, poisons, gas, and aerial gunning at the request of, of corporate uh, agriculture and, and hunters. They slaughter millions of wild animals a year with taxpayer dollars, including over 100,000 vital native predators like wolves, cougars, coyotes, and bears. So free range isn't an environmentally friendly alternative to factory farm meat. Another problem is that all the GMO corn and soy fed to factory farm animals takes lots of water to produce. So here you can see the gallons of water that it takes to produce a pound of food that we buy at the supermarket. So how many of you have heard to take shorter waters to help, but shorter showers to help save water? And how many of you heard that to eat less meat and dairy, you can help save water? Okay, that's more than usual, but this is a humanist group. Um, so in California, where we have a long-running drought, it turns out that consumers use only 4% of the water. The meat and dairy industry uses 45%. So you can save the same amount of water by skipping one gallon of milk or 27 showers. And a single hamburger also requires as much water to produce as a month's worth of showers. So by far, the single greatest way we can help save water is to eat fewer of these water-intensive animal products and more efficient plant-based foods. And the final problem with GMO corn and soy is that it's been genetically modified to withstand Monsanto's Roundup pesticide. Pesticides are, of course, toxic for workers, for pollinators like bees and butterflies, and for the surrounding ecosystems. Most of the pesticides in the US are used to grow corn and soy to feed to animals on factory farms.
Once the GMO pesticide-laden feed is harvested, it's then laced with antibiotics. 80% of antibiotics in the U.S. are given to animals on factory farms, partly to make them grow faster and partly to keep them from dying off due to the horrible unsanitary conditions in which they live. This overuse of antibiotics on factory farms is breeding antibiotic-resistant bacteria, which may be infecting people. So all of these antibiotics, water, and feed given to these 9 billion animals goes through their systems and comes out as, you guessed it, poop. Imagine if every man, woman, and child just peed and pooped into giant open air pits all year round, and that's what you've got on factory farms. So what happens to all this poop? Entire life spent standing on concrete floors. Mother pigs are locked in metal cages, 
so small that they literally cannot even turn around for months at a time. This is not a partisan issue. We are all opposed to children being made sick, to animals being abused, and to everyday people's lives being ruined by the stench of cesspools in their backyards. These thousands of lakes of toxic waste must be among the most bizarre and disturbing environmental phenomena that have ever confronted America. And they've been kept well hidden from the public for long enough. So, all this poop also contributes to climate change. A report from the UN Food and Agriculture Organization revealed that animal agriculture accounts for more greenhouse gases than all the planes, trains, and automobiles combined. Part of the reason is that animals, especially cows, emit, directly emit greenhouse gases. They burp methane and their poop releases nitrous oxide. Methane is 20 times worse for the climate than carbon dioxide. And nitrous oxide is up to 300 times worse for the climate than carbon dioxide. So what's coming out of cows is 300 times worse than what's coming out of our cars. Here we see the relative carbon imprints. Lamb has the single highest. Not on the slide I want to be. Nope. Sorry. Okay. Um, uh, lamb has the single highest followed by beef. Chicken is generally touted as the most sustainable, but its carbon footprint is still more than three times greater than a plant-based protein like tofu. So according to the Sierra Club, if everyone ate in the U.S. ate four vegetarian meals a week, it would have the same impact as if everyone in the U.S. switched to a hybrid. Okay. Um, another study found that not eating meat just one day a week saves more greenhouse gas emissions than buying local food 100% of the time. That's not to say that you shouldn't buy local it's great to support local farmers, but in terms of decreasing your carbon footprint, it's about more about what you're eating than where it comes from. So factory farms will continue to thrive and pollute and exploit workers and animals as long as we pay them by buying their products. Well, we can choose to take action on a daily basis by boycotting these products. It doesn't have to be all or nothing. So if you're looking to change your eating habits, I encourage each of you to think about what's most important to you. If you're concerned about the environmental effects, the three worst products are beef, cheese, and lamb. Cutting these th three foods out of your diet will dramatically decrease your carbon footprint. If you're concerned with animal suffering, really all animal products are bad, but arguably the three worst are eggs, milk, and chicken. I'm vegan. I don't eat or wear any animal products whatsoever. My dog, Zach, is vegan as well. But you don't have to be 100% vegan to put almond milk on your cereal. You don't have to self-identify as a vegetarian in order to order a veggie burger at a restaurant. People often default to the non-vegan option because they don't label themselves as vegan. But why not default to the more sustainable and humane choice? As well, as a humanist, I suggest we give some thought to what matters as an ethical community. In my view, animal exploitation, like racism and sexism, calls for a community response.
So it's never been easier to eat a healthy and varied diet consisting of plant-based foods. The company that um, makes Just Mayo has 500 products in their pipeline. And it works. Um, meat consumption has been declining in the U.S. for the first time in over 40 years, over 50 years, actually. Um, as a result, there are nearly a billion fewer animals being factory farmed than there were four years ago. That said, and I think this is a real ethical issue, we are exporting our eating habits. So developing countries have exactly the opposite uh, trend. They're eating more meat. They're eating more like Americans. So every time you decide not to eat an animal product, you're taking action against one of the most destructive industries on the planet. That's it. If you're curious about the stats, you can find citations for all the information on the FFAC website. That's ffacoalition.org. I'd love to get your feedback. If you don't mind taking out your smartphones um, and uh, filling out a short survey, it'll just take a minute. You, you can also sign up for our mailing list if you like. And while you're doing that, I want to talk about another project that I am working on. This is not an FFAC project. Um, uh, Direct Action Everywhere recently completed a nine-month investigation of diesel turkey farms. Diesel turkeys um, is actually the highest rated uh, turkey uh, company, and they sell their turkeys to Whole Foods. They're labeled humane and thoughtfully raised. And so because this is a uh, humanist community, I know the chances are good that those of you who are meat eaters um, would purchase uh, something labeled as humane because you want to do the right thing for animals. Um, I am working on actually a lawsuit um, uh, that alleges consumer fraud. It turns out that from our investigation, we found out that the diesel turkey farm, the one that you see pictures of with happy turkeys and grass and trees, is just a front. And behind it is just a regular factory farm. So you're actually paying more for diesel turkeys, which and those turkeys are undergoing the same horrible conditions as turkeys you know, that you buy at Safeway for half the price. So I am going to leave a stack of these here and um, request that if you or anyone you know has purchased a diesel turkey, especially at Whole Foods, please get in touch with me. I'm looking for plaintiffs for a uh, class action. So questions? Um, <clears throat> thank you for giving this presentation. Um, I got converted to veganism by hearing Bob Linden and uh, Gary Francioni and Will Tuttle and a bunch of other great people. Um, can you talk about ag-gag rules? The ag-gag rules? Sure. Um, yeah, unfortunately, um, a growing number of states have what's what are known as ag gag rules and what that means is basically you can't um, uh, activists are not allowed to publicize what they see what goes on in factory farms so I mean there are definitely First Amendment issues with this unfortunately big ag has very powerful lobbies so um, we are fighting this 
every step of the way. You know, every as as soon as one of um, these uh, uh, rules or these bills comes to the legislature, a whole bunch of activists go to the state, go to that state, and oppose it. The latest one was Idaho, I believe. Oh yeah, there, there. It's it, there are criminal penalties for exposing what goes on in factory farms. So, in fact, the FBI considers animal activists to be uh, domestic terrorists. In that case, that drone, I guess, that was flying over the factory farm, and they had those little clippings. Well, what's happening with that, A, and B, you said something about Europe, this isn't factory farming, is not happening in Europe, or what, because well, more people are eating meat there, but they don't have factory farms? No, actually, I wasn't talking about Europe, I was talking about developing countries, that we are exporting, our, that's in the same way that we export other aspects of our culture, our clothes, our music, you know, to um, developing countries, we are exporting our eating habits. And as people um, go online and see what we're eating, um, what we're wearing, they want to be more like us. Um, and, and so this uh, culture of what I call carnism is spreading to uh, the third world. Um, as for, I'm sorry, I forgot your first question. Oh, the drone. Another question about the drones watching what was going on so at factory farms. So a lot of farms. it depends on what state that was in, because the states have widely varying um, ag ag laws. Hi. Uh, yes, my name is Byron. Um, I was a little confused by, um, and I've heard this before, that lamb is is far worse than than beef uh, regarding. Um, greenhouse gas output or, or uh, environmental issues generally. Right. I, I don't understand how or why. The, I don't, I'm not aware of factory farms in lamb production or that sort yeah. of thing. How, how and why is that true? I think it just has to do with um, lamb is much more expensive and so um, uh, it takes more, it's just more expensive to produce because they're, it's not, they don't have the same economies of scale as beef. Yeah. It, um, so lamb is yeah the, has the largest carbon footprint. Um, if if you'd like me to, because I really don't know the details of this, if you'd like me to find out, I'd be happy to do that and get back to you. Um, that that said, given my dog Zach, um, the idea of of killing a a, a little lamb um, so as to consume its legs, <laughs> that seems rather horrendous. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Please wait for the microphone. Thank you very, very much. That was really great. Um, I just wanted everyone to know that there's brochures um, with all that information available, and there's uh, guides to going vegetarian up at the front, too. I was, I really enjoyed this presentation because I kind of covered some of the same things. I kind of covered some of the same things when I did a, a presentation in my food agriculture class. And I was, I basically, I realized all the problems with, with uh, factory farming, but I feel like a little bit hopeless about switching people to vegan. So I came at it with the angle of um, lab grown meat as a viable alternative in the future. I was wondering what you thought about that, or if there was anything, any like downsides to it that, that you're aware of. To lab grown meat? Yeah. Okay, so quite a few companies now have invested a whole lot of money in, in lab grown meat. Um, and uh, Bill Gates and a lot of investors who tend to know what they're doing say the future of meat is um, lab grown. Um, and I, I have to say I'm conflicted and, and personally I'm conflicted and I've heard different opinions. So 
I don't think it's impossible to change culture. And what I'm really looking for is culture shift um, in the long term. Uh, I'd like, in fact, to start, I think that, that the way to start is with geographical concentration. And I'm very active with a group that is trying to convert Berkeley, for starters. OK, so I think that if any city will be the model for a cruelty-free city, it will be Berkeley. Um, so in that sense, um, this, this uh, lab-grown meat might work sort of transitionally, but ultimately I'd like I'd like us to be a population that doesn't look to meat or meat lookalikes or meat taste alikes um, as our uh, basic uh, food. So you know, I and and I think we all run into this um, when we see uh, vegan menus that say, you know, chicken. Well, it's obviously it's tofu, you know, with chicken kinds of seasonings or or shrimp, which is tends to be yam protein. Um, I like it, but it's not shrimp, and I'd rather people think of it as yam, you know. But yeah, um, for some people, I understand um, the idea of meat eating is is so ingrained in us that there's going to be a transition period. Hi, um, I found your talk very interesting. As a son of a butcher, I am rather appalled, upset, and agree with what's going on with factory farming is uh, just terrible. Um, I was pleased at the end where you were saying what your real agenda was, a culture shift, because that's not, the presentation was highly emotionally charged, cherry picking the worst examples, etc. There are people raising things um, are you familiar with Tamara Farms in Sonoma? Mm -hmm. What do you yeah. think of them? They, they deal with all of the issues you're talking about, I believe. I've been there. Mm -hmm. And they deliver here, too. Mm -hmm. So, and again, now I'm speaking for myself, not for a Factory Farm Awareness Coalition. Our FFAC's mission is to educate people on what goes on at factory farms. And our, you can check all our statistics and data on our website. So none of this is my own investigation. It's, it's FA, FFAC um, facts and figures, OK? Um, I don't think it's cherry picking. I think you know a lot of these are government figures. Um, but you're welcome to check, you know, ch look on our website and look at all the look at all our statistics. So that is, um, when I talk about a culture shift, um, it's one, it is, yes, that is, it, that is my personal um, wish. Um, I'm a humanist. I care about all sentient creatures. So um, I, if, if, if a creature has the ability to feel fear and terror and pain, I want to avoid it. And since we can, as humans, since we have the ability to survive and thrive without harming creatures that would like to live, I think, personally, I think we should do so. And I'm speaking as a humanist, not as um, an FFAC uh, representative. I think one, <clears throat> excuse me. I think one thing that could be done, uh, rather than spending so much effort on just exposing this, is to present the delicious menus that can be uh, contrived with uh, plant foods. Most of us have been, <clears throat> excuse me again, uh, raised on typical Midwestern diets, and uh, <laughs> I was very recently, or just fairly recently, exposed to. Um <clears throat> I'm having a problem here. Um, the variety of, uh, of ve uh, vegetarian dishes by visiting a restaurant in Santa Cruz. I don't know whether there are any locals, 
but um, I'd like to know of some because the food and the variety was delicious. The other thing is that rather than lab uh, manufactured meat, oh, we could easily convert to textured soy, which with the uh, genius of uh, chemical uh, food chemists, which there are a number in this country, you could easily pr pr uh, produce a very good analog of any meat, probably much more tasty and tender than any steak you now buy at a, probably a third of the cost and certainly a heck of a lot less environmental damage. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. It was a wonderful presentation. Just as a San Jose vegan, I wanted to mention there's Loving Hut, Happy Hooligans, Veggie Grill, Vegetarian House, all very close by that are all plant-based uh, restaurants, and they're just wonderful. Um, just a quick note, if there are any high school teachers here, or if you are friends with a high school teacher, please see me before you go, because I was just hired by um, Ethical Choices Program out of Atlanta, and they have a very similar presentation, but it's geared towards high school students, and it's not promoting any agenda, it's just informative and helping students develop critical thinking and defining and exploring their values as it relates to their diet. And it's a very similar, wonderful program. And I'm you know, looking for high schools that might want the presentation because we're new to California. OK. Thank you very much for your talk. And, um, Pleasure. Thanks and for, for answering me. our questions. And please feel free to get to know us better while we're waiting for lunch to be ready. And join us at the speaker's table with the red tablecloth for lunch and further discussion. Thank you. Thanks for having me.